In this lesson, we will discuss the motion of rigid bodies moving in a plane. A rigid body is a system of particles in which the distances between the particles are constant in time. We will assume that any change in shape that occurs during a process is much smaller than the movement of the body as a whole and can be neglected. Additionally, we also will assume that the motion of a rigid body occurs in a single plane. We'll treat the body as a thin slab. The center of mass of the rigid body is often denoted by the symbol CM or G. Rigid bodies may translate, rotate, or a combination of both. Translation is motion in which all particles of a body move in congruent curves. The body may move in a straight line or move in a curved path. For this type of motion, the kinematic equations developed for a single particle can be used to describe the motion of the entire rigid body since all particles in the body move at the same velocity and acceleration. The second type of motion is rotational. A rigid body undergoes rotational motion if all particles move in circular paths about an axis of rotation. In general, rigid bodies may undergo both translational motion and rotational motion. As mentioned earlier, the kinematic equations for a single particle can describe the motion of a rigid body undergoing purely translational motion. Now let's derive the equations that describe rotational motion. We describe rotational motion using angular quantities. Let's pick two arbitrary lines on the rigid body shown here. The angle between line 1 and the horizontal is theta 1, and the angle between line 2 and the horizontal is theta 2. The angle between line 1 and line 2 is theta 1 2. From the diagram, theta 1 plus theta 1 2 is equal to theta 2. Notice that theta 1 2 will always be constant because the distance between the two lines is constant in time. Let's imagine the rigid body rotates for a time interval delta t. Theta 1 would change by delta theta 1 and theta 2 would change by delta theta 2. However, delta theta 1 2 does not change and so delta theta 1 2 is 0. We are left with delta theta 1 equals delta theta 2. Line 1 undergoes the same angular displacement as line 2. Since the lines were drawn arbitrarily, this means that all lines on a rotating rigid body undergo the same angular displacement. If we differentiate the equation theta 1 plus theta 1 2 equals theta 2 with respect to time, we obtain the time rate of change of the angular displacement, also called the angular speed. Since theta 1 2 does not change in time, d theta 1 2 dt is 0, and theta 1 dot equals theta 2 dot. Often angular speeds are written as omega, so we rewrite the equation as omega 1 equals omega 2. This equation states that the angular speed of line 1 equals the angular speed of line 2, and since the lines were drawn arbitrarily, this means that all lines on a rotating body have the same angular speed. Taking the derivative with respect to time again, we have theta 1 double dot equals theta 2 double dot. Often angular accelerations are written as alpha, so we have alpha 1 equals alpha 2. This equation states that the angular acceleration of line 1 equals the angular acceleration of line 2. Since the lines were drawn arbitrarily, this means that all lines on a rotating body have the same angular acceleration. Using integration, we can obtain the change in angular displacement and change in angular speed during a certain time period. d theta dt is equal to omega, and d omega dt is equal to alpha. We bring dt to the right side of both equations and integrate. In the left equation, d theta is integrated from an initial angle theta naught to a final angle theta, and omega dt is integrated from an initial time zero to a final time t. On the right equation, 
d omega is integrated from an initial angular speed omega naught to a final angular speed omega, and alpha dt is integrated from an initial time zero to final time t. Theta is equal to theta naught plus the integral of omega dt integrated from time zero to final time t. Omega is equal to omega naught plus the integral of alpha dt integrated from time zero to a final time t. We would need to know more about omega and alpha before being able to evaluate the integrals. For the case where the angular acceleration is constant, alpha can be pulled out of the integral in the right equation and omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha times t. If we then plug in this expression for omega into the equation on the left and pull out the constants omega naught and alpha from the integral, we get theta is equal to theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. Just as a reminder, the last two highlighted equations are only valid for constant angular acceleration. It's interesting to note that the translational and rotational kinematic relationships are analogous to each other. The linear displacement s is analogous to the angular displacement theta. The linear speed v is analogous to the angular speed omega, and the linear acceleration a is analogous to the angular acceleration alpha. When a rigid body rotates about a fixed axis, all points on the body move in concentric circles about the axis of rotation. The body shown here is rotating at an angular speed omega and an angular acceleration alpha, and the distance from the axis of rotation to a particle is r. The linear velocity of the particle is perpendicular to the path and has a magnitude of omega times r. The tangential component of the linear acceleration is alpha times r, and the normal component of the linear acceleration is omega squared times r. Although we know the magnitude of the angular velocity and angular acceleration vectors, we need to determine their direction as well. In order to do this, it is helpful to look at the rigid body at an angle. For a particle undergoing circular motion, the magnitude of the particle's linear velocity, angular velocity, and position are all related by the equation v equals omega times r. Now we will examine how the directions of the three vectors are related to each other. Notice that the linear velocity vector v and the position vector r are always perpendicular to each other. Also notice that if the angular velocity vector omega is always perpendicular to the position vector r, the magnitude of the cross product of omega and r will be omega times r, since the angle between the two vectors would always be 90 degrees. Since omega times r is the speed v, this means that omega cross r produces a vector with the same magnitude as the velocity vector if omega is perpendicular to r. Since the cross product of any two vectors produces a third vector that is perpendicular to the original two vectors, this means that the velocity vector is perpendicular to both r and omega. And since v and r are in the same plane of motion, omega must be perpendicular to the plane of motion. The linear velocity v of any point on the rigid body is equal to the body's angular velocity omega cross the position vector r. The direction of omega can be found by using the right hand rule. Stick out your right hand in the direction of the position vector and curl your fingers in the direction of the velocity vector. Now stick out your thumb. That is the direction of the angular velocity vector. Now we need to find the direction of the angular acceleration vector. The linear acceleration is the time derivative of the linear velocity. Plugging in omega cross r for velocity and applying the chain rule, we obtain omega dot cross r plus omega cross r dot. Omega dot is the angular acceleration alpha and r dot is the linear velocity v. Plugging in omega cross r for v, we arrive at alpha cross r plus omega cross the quantity omega cross r. We can find the direction of alpha using similar logic as when we found the direction of omega. 
If alpha and r are always 90 degrees to each other, the magnitude of alpha cross r is alpha times r, which is the magnitude of the tangential component of the linear acceleration a sub t. So alpha cross r produces a vector with the same magnitude as a sub t if alpha is perpendicular to r. Since a sub t must be perpendicular to alpha and r, and a sub t and r reside in the plane of rotation, this means that alpha must point out of the plane of rotation and alpha cross r is equal to the tangential component of the linear acceleration a sub t. The direction of alpha can be found by using the right hand rule. Stick out your right hand in the direction of the position vector and curl your fingers in the direction of the tangential acceleration vector. Now stick out your thumb. That is the direction of the angular acceleration vector. In the image shown on the bottom right, omega and alpha are pointed in the same direction. This means that the angular velocity of the rigid body is increasing. If omega were pointed upward and alpha were pointed downward, the angular velocity of the rigid body would be decreasing, and if alpha were zero, the angular velocity would be constant. Now let's examine the second term in the linear acceleration equation, omega cross v. We previously found that omega and v are perpendicular to each other. The magnitude of omega cross v is omega times v, which we know is the magnitude of the normal component of the linear acceleration. Using the right hand rule, omega cross v points toward the axis of rotation in the same direction as the normal component of the linear acceleration a sub n. Therefore, omega cross v is equal to the normal component of the linear acceleration. Here's a summary of the relationships between the linear velocity vector, angular velocity vector, linear acceleration vector, angular acceleration vector, and position vector for rotational motion.